We live in a time that does not take promises seriously. And that's evidenced by the rampant divorce rates we see and the ease, I think, on a more personal level, even if you've never experienced divorce, of with, or with which we rather break our word. I'll be home at 5.45, we say, and then we show up at 6.15 habitually. And it may seem like a small thing, but if we do it often enough, then we become those kind of people who are unreliable with our word. But on a more serious level, the resurrection of Christ reminds us that the fulfillment of the promises of God comes to their fruition in the resurrection of our Lord from the dead. So what we want to do in our time together now is to look at the resurrection of Christ in the Gospels. We've looked at it in the Old Testament. We're now going to look at it in the Gospels and then go from there to look at it in Acts and the rest of the New Testament. And what we see in each instance is that the resurrection fulfills the promises God made to us in the Old Testament. Well, let's start off then in Matthew chapter 28 and verses 1 through 10. I will just read the first verse there. And we'll focus on details among the, the four gospel accounts, uh, each one bringing out a different facet of what the resurrection means for us. So Matthew 28 and verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, why do we, why do we start there? Why, why do we want to focus in on this verse particularly? Well, we have to understand again the milieu, the cultural context in which Matthew was writing. And in this context, as numerous scholars have pointed out, the testimony of women was not taken seriously. And in Jewish law at the time, if you read the, the writings of rabbis that would have been alive at the time of Jesus that were commenting on the scriptures, they said, you know, we don't listen to women in courts of law. Their testimony is not to be trusted. And so when we come to the resurrection account, which capstones each gospel, which is it's the high point of each gospel, which is what led one scholar to say, you know, the, the gospels are essentially uh, passion narratives with resurrection accounts. And, and when you, you come to the end there and you come to this verse, it would have been shocking for the original readers to hear the first witnesses to the most exciting miracle that God ever did were women, were two women that came to see the tomb. And, and that reminds us again here, we're reading history. We're reading something reliable. If you were going to invent a legend in the first century, in Jewish culture, you would have made sure that your first witnesses to this legend you were trying to invent were not women. And so what Matthew's recording for us is a surprising account. And one scholar noted that, that if, if we read on in Matthew 28, we've got the women and then we meet the guards who have been amazed by what's happened. And this scholar said that, that, that Matthew has set these two accounts side by side to ask us which one we would believe. Will we believe the women or will we believe the guards? Will we believe what's actually true, the unexpected resurrection, or will we go the way of unbelief? So Matthew 28 and verses 1 through 10. Then if we turn over to Mark's account in Mark 16 of the resurrection, this offers us other details that weren't there in the Matthew, the Matthean account. Let's skip down to verse 6 of Mark 16. So again, opens up the same way. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices. So same, same setting, same context. Then verse 6 of chapter 16 of Mark. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now again, look at the details of this text that are different from the Matthean account. And, and these two words here that are only found in Mark's account are so instructive for us, my friends. Now, it, scholars will, will say, and I think this is right, that Mark is likely writing the eyewitness testimony of Peter. 
So underwriting Mark's gospel is Peter's account of what happened. And there's details throughout the text that kind of bring this out. Um, there's some, some uh, grammatical details of the way Peter speaks in Mark that are very similar to the speech we find in Acts. But I think what's most instructive and that tells us that this is Peter's account are those two little words there in verse 7, and Peter. Now, why would the Lord add those words? And I think the reason that he adds them takes us to the heart of the gospel. Think about that from, Mar from Peter's perspective. Imagine you hear this testimony of these two women, and you've been conditioned your whole life. Don't listen to that. You're a good Jewish fisherman guy. You don't hear that. But on top of that, it had to have come home to Peter by this point that he was the one who denied the Lord. He was the one who had to walk with the shame of going, I was the guy out of everyone who said what I said. Imagine Peter's mindset at this point, where he had, he had called down curses on himself. Surely, he's human like we are. Peter thought to himself, there's, there's no hope for someone like me. And then he hears this account from these two women who said, and oh, by the way, specifically, the angels told us to tell you, go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going to meet you. And that could be the gospel in two words, my friends, and Peter. The good news is for the failures, the betrayers, those who wanted nothing to do with his grace, and the ones who let him down the most, he is the most gracious towards. That's what he does here. And, and isn't it interesting that the angels come and say that? And, and, and Peter's thinking at that point, can you imagine how he felt? Because surely his first question was, is it for me? And that's a question so many people have today. This all sounds great in theory. Is it for me? You don't know what I've done. Can it be any worse than what Peter did? And yet the gospel is the gospel of and Peter. And then if we turn over to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 24, an extended account of the resurrection and the post-resurrection events. There's, there's a lot we could say here, but let's just focus on uh, the distinctive details of this text, specifically beginning in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about several, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. And then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had, they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So, same setting, resurrection. It's happened. This detail Luke puts in front of us is so instructive. So notice so many details here. Let, let's, let's just focus on a few of them. They were kept from seeing him. And, and we're going to see this in John's gospel too when Mary doesn't recognize him. 
And once again, that reminds us it's got to be the Lord who opens our eyes for us to see the truth of the resurrection. And when their eyes were open, they know exactly who it is. But they're making their way, they're feeling sad, but notice this, they were dejected because they didn't believe. So once again, we come back to the historical reality of the resurrection. This wasn't something they were looking for. They didn't believe it even after they had the testimony of the women and they said yes and some others went and saw it. We still don't believe. And then we get the greatest Bible study in the history of mankind. We have a, a, a retired minister at our church who had been a minister at our church before he retired. Uh, he now teaches and he has taught the same Bible study to the same group of men every Friday morning for 41 years. And it's just amazing to see the, the guys who, their kids are my age, who had, they had all been younger than we are now when they started this Bible study. And every week, I mean, the, the guy who teaches it is just a magnificent teacher and the, the, it has changed just countless lives through this Bible study. And as I was thinking about that in reading this text, here is the greatest Bible study that's ever happened, where Jesus walks them through the scriptures, all things concerning him. And this is a, a principle for us as we read the Bible, that we should never think of the Old Testament as somehow just stories. No, no, Jesus tells us there, he says, wasn't it necessary that all this happened? How did, how did you miss that? It's almost chiding them in a way. And then, and then he says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, which is a shorthand way of saying the Old Testament. He says, here's what they teach about me. And again, we need to recover this understanding today as we have so much confusion about what the Old Testament is and what it does and how we're to read it. It is a Christ-centered book and collection of books, rather. It is a, a Christ-centered document. It is focusing, riveting our attention in every detail, from the Psalms to Ecclesiastes, Jesus at the center. But notice what he says to them, too. He says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Once again, Jesus says, this isn't new information. You should have seen this in the Old Testament. We all should see it. And the reason we don't, and Jesus is not being harsh with us here, but he's saying it's foolishness not to believe. It's foolishness not to understand these things. And so we could say that about people misunderstanding the resurrection today. Unbelief is foolishness. Not trusting the one who made heaven and earth is foolishness. But then if we skip down to verse 36, we, we find Jesus meeting his disciples. Let's pick it up there. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood, stood among them and said, Peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought he, they saw a spirit. Now, why were they startled and frightened? Well, because they thought they saw a spirit. But go down to uh, verse 39. Here's what Jesus says. See my hands and my feet that it is I myself, touch and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now, why is this important? One of the early heresies in the church was that Jesus was not really a man, that he just appeared to be a man, and the Greek verb for to appear is dokeo, and so this heresy was called docetism. It's an Anglicanization of the Greek word. That Jesus really wasn't a man, he just appeared to be. And it's an interesting aside that, you know, that's a very early heresy, about 100 years or so after Jesus was raised from the dead. The early church heresies at that point were all that, that Jesus certainly was God, but he wasn't man. And then in a few centuries, you see it go the other way where he was certainly man and probably not a God. It's just how that, that heresy had worked. But here, Jesus comes and says to them, and this was an important text as they fought this heresy, look at me, touch me, see me. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. Then he has something to eat with them. And, and, and it's just astonishing to think about, isn't it? 
Uh, Jesus says, let me have a meal with you, but he's concerned for them to see that this is the same guy they walked around with for three years. It's the same one who's now been raised and glorified. And again, we come back to the physical reality of the resurrection, my friends. And any church or teacher that denies that, you can tell immediately they're wrong because Jesus tells us himself from his very lips, I am alive physically. And as an aside, that reminds us of the physical goodness of creation. And throughout church history, you see this this slide towards a despising of material reality. And we see that today in how we treat our bodies. We either idolize them or we despise them. All of that comes from a very Greek worldview. It has nothing to do with the scriptures, which affirm everywhere and seal with the resurrection of Christ, the goodness of physical reality, fallen to be sure, but good. And then the last account we come to is in John's gospel, John chapter 20. And a number of details stand out here. John chapter 20. And let's pick it up where he appears to Mary Magdalene. Again, uh, coming to the tomb. And Peter, in this account, um, comes in with her, and these are, again, eyewitness accounts, so we'd expect some variation in details. But then verse 11, John 20, verse 11, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Now, John loves to do this. He loves to take the historical reality and remind us of the pregnant theology that underwrites it. Did you notice that little detail? Supposing him to be the gardener. Now, where were Adam and Eve placed? In the garden. Where where did the fall, where did did all of the ruin that the resurrection has to undo come from? A garden. And this address woman, by the way, that does not come through in our English translations, and Jesus uses it a, a few times in this gospel. And we can kind of hear that as like, woman, do something for me. That is not at all how he means it. It's a term of respect and endearment. And he asks her this question, then opens her eyes, and I... It's one of those things where if I hear my wife call my name versus somebody else, I hear, a, I hear thousands of hours of love in her voice. And that's what Mary heard here. She heard her name being called in such a way that there was only one person who could have said it, and it was the one who had loved her before the creation of the world. And she responds with the only, the only thing she can say, which is, again, a term of endearment, but also recognizing Jesus' authority. But it all happens in a garden, and John is saying to us, all that went wrong in the garden has now been made right in the garden of resurrection, partially at this point, and at one day fully, as we'll see in a future lecture. Two more details in the Jenonine text that we want to pay attention to. Verse 24 of chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's what he says. We don't even have any any indication that Thomas actually touched him. But we have one of the strongest evidences for the deity of Christ. And this is the capstone of John's gospel that began in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now the confession that capstones this gospel that bookends it is, my Lord and my God, from Thomas's lips. That's all he can say when he sees the resurrected Christ. But what's more important is what Jesus says to Thomas and to us. Because you've seen, have you believed? And there's some grammatical ambiguity here in the original. Is it a question? Is it a rebuke? I think it's left intentionally vague. I think it's both and. And Jesus pronounces a benediction on the life of faith when he says, if you haven't seen, blessed are you. That's every one of us here. Every one of us who have believed simply on the testimony of John and the other apostles. That's why he says in verse 30, verse 31, these are written so that you may believe and have the same benediction pronounced on your life. It's the reality of walking by faith and not by sight. That's what he commends to Thomas. That's what he commends to us. And then the last detail in this text, 21 verse 9. As Jesus appears to them, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So they have this miraculous catch. And notice if you look, look at the next, very next verse, verse 11, 153. Again, if you're making up something, you don't put 153. You put, they caught some fish. Exact number. You think that may have stuck with John. But I just love the reality of the deity and humanity of Christ in this episode, in his post-resurrection appearance. I want you to think about the one who was there from the beginning, who had cleaned fish and had charcoal on his hands. Our God is the God who will get charcoal on his hands and fish guts. My, my kids, you know, they don't, they like catching the fish. They don't like the part afterwards. There's nothing like fresh fish, is there? And you think about Jesus, probably still scarred definitely still scarred from the cross, fixing breakfast for his disciples. So all of these accounts show us the reality of the resurrection, but they also show us the reality of God's love for sinners like us. He's the God who is the God of and Peter. He's the God who will say, the first people I appear to will be the ones most forgotten in this society. He's the God who will walk us through and show us all of where he comes from in the Old Testament. And he's the God who's got charcoal on his hands. And there's no other one like him. And there's no one else we should trust or believe, given the reality of the resurrection and the reality of the God of resurrection.